last few weeks uh, on creation versus evolution, and this is the beginning of a study that we're going to continue on for a while with different, different topics. Um, Dusty is sitting here, you know Dusty Paul, he brought me a Bible and it's a uh, NRSV, uh, <coughs> New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I want you to listen, this is a commentary. Is it, you, I, I get it. Well, some, some people probably say, why does he keep harping on this creationism? Why does he keep talking about it? Why is it so important? I mean, we believe it. So why is he here? Here's why. This is a Bible, right? In our I want you to listen to what the commentary says in this Bible. And I appreciate you bringing it, Dusty. Because I didn't, I, I hadn't heard of the things, but I hadn't seen it. But here's what it says. Some Christians believe that God actually created the world in seven 24-hour days. Such a belief comes from a literal reading of the first chapter of Genesis as though it were a scientific textbook. <laughs> However, Genesis was written not as a science article, but as a series of symbolic <coughs> stories, sometimes called mythic stories that convey great moral and spiritual truths. We should not try to come to any scientific conclusions about the creation of the world from reading these stories. Now, this is a Bible with a commentary that was written and printed, and no doubt how many has been sold. Mythic stories are one literary type or genre you just have to look in a newspaper to see examples of different literary genres, news stories, advice columns, editorials, and comics. Each genre has different rules for interpret interpreting its meaning. The Bible also contains many types of literary genres, including hero stories, poetry laws, legends, fictional satire, debates and letters. To properly understand the Bible, pay attention to the literary genre. Otherwise, you might believe the Bible is saying something God doesn't intend. Now, you know what I do to this? You guessed it. The NRSV Catholic Edition, the Catholic Youth Bible, the youth Bible. Now why would he put commentaries in the youth Bible like that? Because they want to teach them young. That the Bible, now, if I can't trust Genesis 1, then how can I trust Romans 3.23? How can I trust Matthew or Luke? If it's wrong in one point, you've got to get this. This is why it's important. Thank you, Dustin. Now go throw a piece of junk away. <laughs> if this Bible is wrong at one point, then it could be wrong everywhere. If I lie to my son one time about one thing, then how could he trust me on anything else that I say? You understand? If God was wrong or this inspired word of God was wrong, and if it's not infallible, then now we have no foundation. That's exactly what the religious world. Uh, let's not even talk about the, the heathen world that don't even believe in a God or they're atheists or, you know, that's not to talk about. We're just talking about the religious world. Not the spiritual world, but the religious world wants to take the foundation, the road, if you will, right out from under us. Now I'm telling you, it's happening. That's why this that I'm teaching and we're talking about is so important. Yes. It's so important. And it needs to be, in my opinion, it needs to be taught in every church that truly believes in the God. Amen. Because our kids need to hear it. And they're not hearing it in school, so they've got to hear it somewhere. Right. they got to hear it somewhere. Even adults that's been in church all their life sometimes doubt the very fact that God created. That is just so foreign to me, I can't receive it. I just don't want to. I don't even want to leave a, a seed of thought or doubt in my mind. So we're teaching, as the Bible said, one day means one earth rotation. One month means one time the earth and the moon rotate. 
one year as the earth rotates around the sun one time. That was in the beginning, and it's the same way today. He didn't speed nothing up, or we'd have flew off in space. He didn't slow it down, or we'd be pulled, sucked right into the gravitational pull of us. In other words, it's that way from the beginning, and it's never, ever changed. Thank the Lord. There's truths and things that God has put in place, no matter where they want to. When it says that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and the city, listen, he wasn't, it wasn't some imagery, it was fact. It wasn't a story, it's real. I hope and pray. I, I know you guys, you believe that, but I just got, I wanted to bring that up because I appreciate the time of this of what he quoted to because that right there proves what I'm trying to say. The religious world is trying to take us away, the very foundation of the church, and belittle a heavenly God that's created all this. When you do that, and you can't trust that God created, Brother Al, I am so glad to see you tonight. We have been so worried about you. We're thankful you came. We don't, hey, before you leave tonight, we want your name, address, phone number, and anything else we get from you because we didn't know where in the world we go punch you at. So we need every information, please. So in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Sorry, side note. This is more important than what I was saying. That's why I used to focus, right? God created heaven and earth. Listen to me. That's the way it happened in seven days. Now, then some people, even in the church, believe there's all kinds of things in the Bible or not in the Bible. And then whether we believe, how does dinosaurs fit in to the creation? Well, first of all, I don't know if you've noticed. Have you ever done a science project where you've got insects or bugs? Have you ever pinned them? You've seen some kids, they'll pin them, you know, and they have a little, little thing and a name and all that, the scientific name. I mean, there is like millions. Too many <laughs> of insects in this world. And if you'll notice how creative that God is, it honestly is amazing. It's awesome to see. Even in the smallest of the bugs that he has created, it's amazing. And they have they have reasons and purposes in this world that many times we don't have a clue about. Well, is it not hard to believe that God's created something bigger? And listen, let me just say, and we're going to get into this a little bit, but dinosaur, the word dinosaur bothers us sometimes in the, in the Christian world. Because the word dinosaur never even come around to the, well, about the 1822. So see, maybe say, well, the word dinosaur is not in the Bible. Because there was no such word in the Bible. There wasn't even a minute of word of dinosaur. The word never existed until 1822. That's when the word dinosaur became in existence. And what the word dinosaur means is terrible lizard. Makes sense. I got some teeth that big. I'd say called terrible too, wouldn't you? But here's the thing. So we have a problem with about where's the dinosaur in the Bible? I'm going to show you here in a minute. But let me go on a little farther with this explanation first. Every animal that's been created by God is not in the Bible. We have these strange creatures called anteaters. You ever seen them on National Geographic or something? Strangest, kookiest little things you ever seen. We have these weird things called armadillos that roll up, and I've seen them. And I've actually eaten one of them. Once, but it tasted like chicken, don't worry. <laughs> and Guatemala is where we had, and the lady was cooking it, and she was cooking this weird pot. And I said, well, What is that pot? She said, It's an armadillo. She said, I said, well, What's in this pot? She said, That's the armadillo. I said, she said, You want a bite? I said, well, Sure. How many times do you get a chance to eat armadillo? But they're strange creatures that God has created all the world, right? And it's amazing what he's done and created. Well, it's a known fact, it's scientific, Christian or non-Christian fact, as a science, that reptiles are on continual, they never quit growing. They grow till they die. You understand? 
So the longer they're growing, the bigger they're getting. We get to a point where we grow and then we kind of stop and stop and then we kind of shrink a little bit when it comes to the spinal cords and all that kind of stuff. Reptiles don't do that. They grow until they die. You understand? That's a fact. I mean, that's not me saying this. It's a fact. So it's no wonder that some things got bigger during the age of Noah, Adam, Eve, you know, Caleb. The reason is because man lived to 930, 969 was Methuselah, I think. Uh, man lived a long time. Well, does it make sense that animals would live as long? They have genetic makeup where they can live longer too. So things would grow bigger. That's not a hard thing. Now, I want you to look at Job chapter 40. Now, I want everybody to find the Bible. You don't have one find one. Because I don't want you to take my word for this. I want you to read and I want us to understand what it says. Job chapter 40. I even told my wife, I said, hey, make sure you bring your Bible now. Because I want you to read it too. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to discuss that. <laughs> That's right. Job chapter 40. And we'll start at verse 15. <laughs> the Bible says this, and I'm reading from the King James Version. If you're reading from something different, it may say a little bit different, but this is what the King James says. Behold now Behemoth, which made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in his navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. You know what a cedar tree is, right? He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fins. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook can pass him about. Behold, he drinketh of a river. That's a lot of water, by the way. He drinketh of a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan to his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. Now, that's describing an animal. You understand? That's describing an animal. Now, they would not call it a dinosaur because, again, that word dinosaur never existed at this point in time. This word behemoth is what they called it. That's the name they gave this animal at this particular time of life. So a behemoth, in the Bible commentary, some of them might say it's an elephant. Well, I've never seen an elephant, if you look at the elephant today, you never, you look at its tail, it's got a little bit of a huge body. Big long trunk, but his tail is not as big as a cedar. So it would not fit the description that he's put in here. So some say it is a, a hippopotamus. Again, it doesn't fit the description. So what they're probably describing, and this is a, a known animal that they found fossils with. Now let me just tell you this to you while we're here. They Christian and non-Christian scientists and archaeologists and all those folks have found fossils of giant dinosaurs all over the world. Yes. United States, Canada, Mexico, all over the world. They have found known fossils. It's not make-believe. It's not made up. Scientific fact. Now listen, if you don't believe me, that's all right. You don't have to. But if you, the, one of the premier Archaeologists and scientists, Christian, is his answers in Genesis. We're blessed because, of course, it resides in the Holy Land of Kentucky. <laughs> Just an hour and a half, two hours away, right? And it's right there where he, and, I mean, there's an amazing amount on what I'm covering and much more, much more, more 
an amazing amount of discoveries and things that they have willing to exert self. And these are Christian scientists that's trying and wanting to prove the Bible. So they're not trying to set us off course. They're not trying. So they're saying that it truly was dinosaurs. That is fact with science. Now, there are some people that don't believe it. I, it's okay. But I'm telling you, there is. There's fact. It's, it's not a make-believe story. It really happened. So these huge dinosaurs. So in the Bible, Job chapter 41. Let's read some more. Verse 1 through 15. Canst thou draw out a Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaws through with a horn or thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Will thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou uh, bound him for maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among his merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? Or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him, stir, him, stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of the garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? With his teeth are terrible round about. Listen, verse 16. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. But as Nisi's a light does shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps. Out of his mouth go burning lamps. And sparks of fire leap out. What's that sound like? A dragon. And listen, whether you know it or not, the dragon, the word dragon, is in here quite a bit, like over a hundred times. Okay? And out of the sparks of his fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goes smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindles coals and a flame go up out of his mouth. In his neck remain his strength and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined. Together they are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raises up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that landeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dark, nor the averaging. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rock wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into a stubble. Darks are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp uh, pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his light, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. This thing is then described by God to Job, is what it really was done. And he's talking about this terrible creature that cannot be penetrated, has scales and all this kind of thing. And it's talking about a Leviathan. Well, a Leviathan back then, and more like, well, it was a Mosasaur, which is a fish or a big serpent in the water type thing. And it lived. It was just a huge uh, a reptile or dinosaur, what we call dinosaur today. Like I said before, the word dinosaur didn't come around about 1822. 
So that word is not mentioned in the Bible, but the description is. Now, dinosaurs were created, and evolutionists say that dinosaurs lived for millions of years. They died, and at the end of their lifespan, man was created. That was that's what evolution say. So we really weren't living at the same time frame. We kind of lived at the very end of the lifespan of the dinosaur because they lived for millions of years, and then we come along. Well, what's strange about that is they have found the footprints and the handprints of man right next to a dinosaur. Meaning, you know, mud don't just stay around forever. It's going to rain, it washes away. So it had to be right there. So people say, well, they didn't live at the same time. Yes, they did. It's been shown, like this picture right here, a picture of that. See that little handprint up top? And that's a dinosaur footprint right at the bottom. They lived at the same time. So why didn't the dinosaurs eat the man then? Well, in the beginning, God created. And if you remember, God created us, and he put us in the Garden of Eden. He put everything in the Garden of Eden, as far as that's concerned. And everything didn't kill nothing. There was no death. Everything was peaceful. Everybody got along. Well, I'd like to have some churches like that around the world, wouldn't you? That everybody get along and just be peaceful and give, you know, listen, that'd be great. Listen, that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Dinosaurs didn't eat people at that time. They were meat. There was no death. But after the fall of man, not only did man, and this is why it was so detrimental that man created, we did, Adam, went against God's will, and he not only brought a plight upon himself, he brought it on every living thing in the world. So when he brought death, and this is something that you don't really think about, because we just think about us, because we're more important than anything else. But honestly, we've done an injustice in the world because of Adam's sin. He has done injustice to the whole animal kingdom and everything in the world. Nothing would have died unless sin entered in. So, it makes sense. There's just footprints and dinosaur prints. And one other thing. We think of dinosaurs, and we think this big, huge Tyrannosaurus rex, or Brachiosaurus rex, or all kinds of different big, huge dinosaurs, right? A dinosaur is also as small as a rabbit, or as big as a dinosaur that we think of. So every dinosaur is not big. In fact, the normal or average dinosaur was about the size of a horse, more or less. So we just think of the big outrageous ones that we see with the big teeth and all that kind of stuff. But there's dinosaurs that was all kinds of creation. Of course, that makes sense because God created everything as it was. And he made them and he, they, they multiplied and they've done their own kind. They kept producing their own people. They never kept producing their own species. They never prospered. If that was the case, then we would have a half crocodile on one end and we'd have a half... I don't know, horse on the other. I mean, it wouldn't, it was something that would be, there's no mutations today. Well, where did it all stop? It was, that's what happened. It still ought to be going on. We talked about how we came from apes, and according, according to evolutionists, we came from apes. And, and we said, well, we might have a few examples of that, but I mean, but we don't see people that's half ape and half man today. Well, we don't see half zebras and, and then half, you know, lions coming out. If there was a mutation, why did it stop mutating? But that don't make sense because there is no such thing. When a zebra has a zebra, it's a zebra. It doesn't come out with something else. So the, the six-day creation still sticks to the truth. So people say, well, what happened? What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, first of all, man has caused things to go wrong. That means they, they ate meat. And they killed them because man did the same thing. So why don't we have dinosaurs all over the place now? You know, have you ever seen the movie Jurassic Park where they got to recreate the dinosaurs and they're all on this little island and all this stuff? Well, first of all, the dinosaur, they say, like an alligator, is considered a reptile. And that's what a dinosaur was. So a dinosaur is in the family, if you will, a big family of reptiles. However, the dinosaurs that we're talking about are things
thinking about the Brachiosaurus, the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, all those big, huge dinosaurs. You remember there was a flood, right? And in the flood, there's a lot of things that died. And since the flood, there's a lot of things that's died and went extinct. We have a lot of animals that we no longer have anymore today because they've extinct somewhere along the line between the, the flood and us. They went extinct. They quit living. Well, dinosaurs, as you can imagine, takes a lot of food, a lot of provisions, good conditions. Well, there was none of that. After the flood, you can imagine what kind of vegetation. There's all kinds of supposition. But I'm telling you that most of them, and the reason is we see the fossils. They say, well, it took millions of years to make these fossils and enough dinosaurs to lay out in those fossils so we could dig them up in our perfect shape. Well, instead of the million of years, wouldn't it make sense that there was a great catastrophe? The great catastrophe was that there was a flood. And they killed them instantly. They drowned, was planted in mud, washed over with thousands of gallons of mud, just nothing but mud over them. And so they were preserved perfectly right in that ground. That makes a lot more sense instead of millions of years, and we don't know why, there's all kinds of supposition in, sci in the evolution scientific world that says that the reason we don't have dinosaurs anymore is because they've had slip disc in their back. No kidding. I'm not, I'm not joking. That's, that's one theory. We're talking about theories. So on Sunday morning, I'll tell you, theory is just a hypothesis or a scientific guess is the best way to say it. That's one theory. Is they had slip disc and they couldn't mobilize and so they starved to death. One thing that says that there was a parasite to come and eat them all up. Well, why did they kill everything in that case? Uh, there was, a, you know, of course, the Ice Age. You watch those dinosaur movies that they come out with the kids. That's one reason, and they're cute. You know, uh, what's that one? Uh, little uh, Long Neck. What's the name? Little Foot. Little Foot. Little Foot. You ever watch those old dinosaur movies? They're cute. They're neat. Here's the problem. They're teaching that there's millions of years. And so they're putting it in there, just pushing it a little bit at that age. You see what I'm saying? And so they kind of build on that to get in your mind that there's millions of years between, listen, there's no such thing. So the dinosaurs, with the flood, with those conditions, with things going on, kept getting less and less and less. And now there's no dinosaurs, no extinct dinosaurs. But you know, you realize that we're still discovering new animals almost every day. There's new animals like in the Amazon and, and different places like that, that scientists are still discovering things that they've never seen before, never recognized. And some people believe there is actually a dinosaur somewhere, but we just haven't found them yet. Well, if there's a big, huge dinosaur, I think we'd figure it out that the neck was sticking up over the tree. Somebody would see it from a plane somehow. <laughs> So we found the dinosaurs. 65 million years is what they say. But here's the thing. They use this thing. This is one that's very important. They use this thing called carbon dating. An evolutionist, Robert E. Lee, in his article in 1981, said this. Why do geologists and archaeologists will spend their scarce money on costly radiocarbon determinations? This is carbon dating. Listen. They do so because occasional dates appear to be useful. While the method cannot be counted on, this is an evolutionist scientist, not a Christian type. So he's disproving his own people. He says, the method cannot be counted on to give good and equivocal results. In other words, consistent, stable results. The numbers do impress people and save them the trouble of thinking excessively expressed in what looks like pre precise calendar years, figures seem somewhat better. Absolute dates <coughs> determined by a laboratory carry a lot of weight and are extremely helpful in bolstering weak arguments. This was an evolution scientist. In other words, he said, why are they even doing this anymore? It's been wrong so many times. Why do we even take time to consider it as being bad? And he even tells them why. Because they're lazy. They don't have no other way to do it. This is the only way they can guess the date. And so they're still using something they know is already faulty. That's why they do it. Mr. Lee continues. 
no matter how useful it is, though the radiocarbon method is a gross discrepancy, the chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy, and it all depends upon which funny paper you read. I don't know this guy. He's dead and gone, but I like him. <laughs> he ain't even a Christian, but I like what he said because he's least telling the truth. That they can't even trust this outdated, unreliable testing called carbon dating. Now, I don't know if you've heard or know anything about carbon dating. I'm going to do a brief thing about it because people use this. Our kids are reading this in their science books as it's being fact. Carbon dating says, they're 170 million years old. Carbon dating says, we don't care what carbon dating says because he even says, and there are many other ones that be on that, says it's not even, it's not reliable. They might get lucky once, but it'll be wrong the next. Give me an example. Mount St. Helens exploded several years ago, right? Within our lifetime. When Mount St. Helens explodes, it makes lava, which makes rock. They got a carbon dating test on that rock. And it just got created. They watched it coming out and being created. And they made it so many millions of years old by carbon dating. That's how it right line it is. That's why it's important to understand what it is. So here's what that really brings for us to let run that. The sun shines down in the Earth's atmosphere, which gives nitrogen. The nitrogen atom becomes unstable and changes the carbon. The carbon then combines with our carbon dioxide. Organic objects such as people, animals, plants, trees are either taking in or breathing out carbon dioxide. Everything does it. When an organism dies, it no longer takes in carbon dioxide. That's CO2, what you're still up there. So the carbon, the C14, Isotope continues to decay within more coming in, without more coming in. This decay time is measured by a unit called half-life. In other words, carbon has 5,730 years as a half-life. It lasts that long. So, it's, so the half-life, or the half-time of that, is 5,730 years. The organism is dated by the amount of half-lives that have passed according to the amount currently in the atmosphere. Now, the problem with that is there's so many variables. There's so many things that could go wrong. There's so many things that change the, the outcome. For instance, the amount of carbon has always been the same in the Earth's atmosphere. The canopy, therefore, or theory of creation would mean there was definitely less carbon in the atmosphere when the flood came. The Earth's atmosphere has reached equilibrium. It's stabilized. There is more carbon coming in from the sun now that has been consumed on the Earth. It's like taking a candle and putting it in a glass. And that candle's burning, right? And when it's burning, it's putting off carbon or carbon dioxide. And so there's more carbon inside of there than is on the outside. Well, we have a canopy that you keep hearing about because they say there's holes in it all the time called the ozone. And this canopy keeps the radiation out of the earth and it won't let everything come out. So that's why, that's why oxygen, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, all the elements don't just float off into space anymore. They're staying in here. That's the way God created it, right? It's a shell. It's a, it's a shell carbon or it's an ozone layer which holds the thing in. Have you ever watched the movie where they come and they take the rockets and go out of space and they come back in and it gets really, really hot? You know, where it starts flaming and stuff and gets really hot. It's kind of cool. But that's what they're coming through is a shell of things that actually hold in everything that's good and everything God created. Because that's what God created, though. So if you put a candle in a room and when it's lit, measure the candle, measure the rate of consumption, when it was lit, You'll never know unless you make some assumptions like how long the candle was when it began. How, how uh, has it always burned at the same rate? You know, sometimes the candle burns big flames, some little flames. 
There's so many variables that it doesn't work. Then they use the uranium, the potassium, the argon. I'm not going to go through it all. But there's errors in all of it. Now, they go through a lot of different things, and they try to tell you that evolution can explain it all. There's an ice age. You come up with an ice age. There had to be a big ice age. But what that was was a, a substitute for the flood. They couldn't use the flood because that was actually biblical, and that would give, lit, that would give some uh, veracity to what the Bible says. So they couldn't use the flood, so they changed it to an ice age. Well, that's not what the Bible says, and so that's why they said the dinosaurs died. There's all kinds of things they try to theorize. The problem with their theories are nobody was here. Nobody can testify that's what happened. But we have a divine testimony from the creator of the universe that this is what's happened. In the beginning, God created. The flood came because of sin, the wickedness of man. And then God even said, I'm going to show you and remind you that that happened. I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. Just so you don't forget. I'm going to make a covenant with you. And I'm going to keep that covenant before you. And I tell you, every time it rains, I like to watch to see that rainbow. Because I like that covenant. Because he made it with me and you and everybody else and all living creatures for that matter. That we never have to go through a flood again. So what happened with the flood? Let's talk about the ark a little bit. I think this is really interesting. I think this will help some of you. The length of the ark in Genesis 65, the length of the ark should be 300 cubits. Its width are 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Now, many of you that don't mean a whole lot, we don't use cubits from day to day, right? The ark was not like anything really, a lot of the drawings that we see. It's not a cute little boat with a Animal heads picking out, you know, sticking out the top like we put in our Sunday school rooms. Didn't have anything close to that. Well, the ark like this. The ark at the bottom of this picture. I know there's a few of the pulpit today, so you can see. At the bottom of this picture, you can see the ark. And you can see Queen Mary, the big ship up there. You can see the Titanic, the Wyoming, the Santa Maria. You can, but you see that the ark is 500 and something feet long. All right? So that's what the ark was. The ark was not like these little drones. The ark was a huge vessel. Probably like a barge. Have you ever seen a barge going down the river? And not until the late 1800s was a ship built that exceeded the ark's capacity. It took that long for man to catch up to what God did way back in those days. The ark was one of the largest wooden ships ever created. A mid-sized cargo ship, if you will, by the state standards. God gave Noah the complete plans. And this is something we were talking about the other day. If you'll think for a second, God gave Noah plans. We came from apes according to evolution. If Noah wasn't intelligent and he was from an ape and he could barely speak, you know, we grunted. That's what they said. You have a club in hand, beat your wife across the head. I don't know where that comes from, but anyway, that's what they always portray. Now, if we came from apes and didn't have enough intelligence to communicate, how in the world did Noah have enough intelligence to build a barge the size of a cargo ship in a time they'd never even seen a boat before? They never needed a boat. It never rained. And God gave Noah plans. And Noah went off the plans that God gave him and built it to a tee, and it floated without any problems. Let me tell you something. To be honest, he was more intelligent than most of us running around today. <laughs> I mean, hello. I want you to try. Don't try. Don't try. It ain't going to do no good. You're wasting your time. Ain't going to be another flood like that anyway, so don't even use the word about it. Let's talk about the, the, <clears throat> the uh, icebergs that was, thank you. Let's talk about the icebergs mounting up in Greenland. And they may very well do it. But God promised that there would never be a flood like there was in Noah. I trust God more than anybody out here. I'm just telling you. That's the way it got to. Just to give you an example. That helps. You see the picture of the elephant and the giraffe down there? 
The ark was 44 feet high. Plenty of room. Plenty of room for a giraffe, an elephant. You know how big an elephant is. You see the dinosaur there, the planes and all that? Plenty of room. They had 73 feet wide. This ark was a tremendous feat of ingenuity. It's a football, over a football field long. Well over a football field long. The ark was amazing because God did it. So the evolutionists will say that it took two years to build a modern day ship with all the technology of man's fire. How could Noah and his sons just do it in two years? Now we use mechanical stuff and you know, big lifts and all that. How in the world did Noah build it when he didn't have any of that stuff? Well, the Bible doesn't say that Noah didn't get any help. It doesn't say that he enlist any help, but people are going to pay just like he did now. They're going to do it if they got paid for it. So it's very possible that he got people to help. I don't know. You don't know. But the Bible says he got Noah to build it. Well, if I build something, that don't mean I put every nail and everything in it, right? Sometimes I sublet things. Uh, like when we've been a house in, in Kentucky sometimes. I hardly done anything, but I was in control of everything. Now, I don't know. It's very possible. It could not happen. It could happen. But there's good evidence that Noah was about 13 feet tall. In other words, what they say is sometimes, I mean, we can grow, what, seven foot tall, some of them seven, a little over seven, six, seven foot. <laughs> but he lived 900 and some, 30, what, 930, 930 years. But he, he, they could have grown taller and stronger and they've got less genetic issues message genetic problems. They haven't had all the mutations that we've had. All the cancers rose up, all the Alzheimer's. All that stuff is formed, those folks, because they had more pure genes from Adam and Eve, no doubt. Now, the atmosphere, no, that was probably pure pure. There's a lot of reasons why they could have physically done more good than what we ever thought. Now, the thing is, was God created, He gave them a plan. And he, made, he never gives you a plan. I, this is a great testimony to us. God never gives us a plan to do without giving us the ability to accomplish it. In other words, when he says, when he says, be ye holy, he doesn't tell you that knowing you can't do it. That would be an unjust God. You understand? When he says, sanctify yourselves, he would never tell you to do that unless it was possible for you to do it. He didn't say, live without sin. He would never tell us to do that if we're not possible. He would never say, no, I'll build an ark and hurry because there's a flood coming. You're not going to be able to do it, but do it anyway. God's going to give him the ability. How we did it, I wasn't there. But I can tell you, God gave him the ability to do it because he did it and the ark floated and never sunk, and it accomplished what God intended him to do. Now, how it done it, that's it. I love one day when I get to heaven, we're going to have a nice talk with Noah. Say, Noah, I'm a little interested. How did you do it, folks? I'd like to know. That's going to be an awesome talk. Now, I hope it, I, he's going to have some extravagant, tremendous stories, but I'm telling you, it's amazing what God done. So, how can Noah wrap up all the animals? Well, first of all, in my mind, that God can do all things. Noah didn't have to go looking for them. God spoke to the animals just as much as he spoke to Noah. He created the things. It's his creation. But he didn't sit there and bring the animals to us. Noah didn't go round them up like he's herding cattle. Listen, God sent them to him. He's able to do all things. How could a flood destroy every living thing? Some people believe that the flood was only around where Noah lived. And because he just says it covered the world, means it covered his world. Alright, then you might as well go with that little goofy Bible that I had there and just make up your own story. The Bible says it covered the whole entire world. It covered the earth. Everything on the earth was covered. That makes more sense. Because the things we're finding in the United States of America, no, it didn't live here. And we're finding the evidence of God, or the, the earth, being covered in water, even in Kentucky. The fossils are being found in all over the United States, Canada, places where the water's never even touched. But they say, well, how did that happen? 
Because God is the creator of all things, and he is the one that caused it to happen. If he can speak the world and the universe into existence with the word, I mean, a flood around the world is not hard for him. Forget about it. 
Well, and that is, a, that is a supposition that the flood destroyed all dinosaurs. And then there's some people that say, well, he didn't have to carry a whole dinosaur. He could have carried eggs. He could have caught babies. He could have, you know, that. Whatever happened, they, they are extinct. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I'm thankful they're extinct today. <laughs> It'd be a whole different world that we live in. But, right, it wouldn't function. And God knew the plan. He had a plan all along. So it was not a surprise to God. It's his plan all the way from start to finish. So it's not a shock to us. And whatever happened to him, thank you, Lord. That's all I want to say. Katie. Okay. Speak up. In yeah, regards to the flood. Like, um, I know that it said that we had never had a flood on the earth prior to the flood, but there had been rain, right? Or there's not actually scripture that says yes. that it has not rained. It, it didn't say that. It said there was a mist that would come up to water the vegetation. <laughs> That's what it would say. It would never rain to them, but it said there was a mist, like a you know a sprinkler system within in God's way, but it's a mist that would come to make sure the plants would be able to live. Right. And that's what happened. I know that it says that they had not known a flood like that. But yeah, they, there was never a flood at all. it never says that it had never rained. Nick says it's never, it had never rained. So I'm just... You know, yeah, the only, in the Garden of Eden, it had never, it didn't need to rain. God made a mist to come up to water the plants to make them live and to make them vibrant. Okay. Okay. That's why, yeah, that's why it was so profound when he said, I need to build an ark. And they said, are you crazy? I don't know, you know Kentucky terms here, but they said, are you crazy? Why would you build an ark? It's never rained. It's never, we never had any problem. We don't, we're here. This is the world we live in. We don't need no, no boat. And, but God gave him the word. And there's a lot of messages in this, but God gave him the word, and he obeyed the word against his own logic, against his own rational thinking against all the people that was coming against him, he did it anyway. I love the message of the ark. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can pull out of the ark that we can need to use today. Because there's a lot of stuff that we God tells us to do today and people say it's not possible. But God tells us to do it anyway. And who are you going to believe? And that's where we've got to come in our own faith. Just because they say what's well, not possible, it doesn't make sense. It don't matter. It's God. He can do anything he wants to. Amen? Good question. Any other question? Pat? Can I get a lawyer to my back? You can. We would love to. Come on up. We'll do that here in a second. Any other questions? We're going to switch gears next week and start at more, not so much creation, evolution. If you've got other questions you want to ask or deal with the creation and evolution, I'll be glad to help you. Listen, here's one thing I would like to do as a church. Is to if you want, there's a group of us that want to go either to the Creation Museum. It'd be a great experience. I was five year member. I went there many, many times. I watched them build it and I've been there countless times. I love it. It's tremendous information. A lot more than I can cover or even want to cover. And then also, there are, there are several people that's been interested in going to the Ark. And I would also, I've never been to the ark yet. They said it's a, mag it's a wonderful, magnificent. It gives you a great uh, display of what the ark looked like and all that kind of stuff. If you want to be an ark, ark go to the Creation Museum or the ark. Come talk to me after this is over. We'll discuss it, see how many people's interested, and then we'll see what we can do. Okay? If we go, we'll probably take the bus, but what if we if we got enough. But what I'd like to do is actually kind of take a convoy. But here's the reason. There's so much information. Some people would like to stand and read everything that they got, and it would take you a long time to do that. And some people just kind of want to scan through and go through. So that way you can go at your own speed, your own time, and get as much information as you possibly want. Okay? All right. If you would come up, and we're going to pray for Sister Pat, because in the Bible it says when somebody has an issue that we can come, lay hands on them, anoint them, and God is going to hear our cry. And it's going to answer. Thank you guys for your attention and patience through all this. I hope it's helping you. <coughs> okay, Bob's coming. And we'll end with this. Please be back on Sunday morning.
Pray up, radio. Spirit up.